Global challenges require global solutions. Imagine how much better it would be if we could pool all our scientific resources and cooperate across national borders. The EU has made proposals to do just that. Research and innovation have been at the core of the EU's global response to fight the coronavirus pandemic. International data sharing platforms and results from European projects have shown how we can maximise access to the best scientific knowledge when we join forces. But it has also highlighted the importance of trust and of a level playing field. That is the basis of the EU's new global approach to research and innovation, delivered through three key actions. Firstly, Horizon Europe is open. Openness is essential. The EU and its member states are committed to maintaining strong international partnerships. Horizon Europe, the EU's research and innovation programme, is open to the world. Researchers from all over the globe are invited to participate in the programme in areas such as health, the green and digital transitions and innovation. Secondly, joining forces through multilateral partnerships. The EU develops targeted international cooperation actions in calls for proposals in areas of mutual interest under Horizon Europe and exploits the opportunities for association to the programme. Thirdly, while pursuing a level playing field. Openness and partnerships are key, but at the same time we need to protect our fundamental values and principles. This new EU approach will ensure that research and innovation are carried out fairly and used for the good of everyone. This is at the heart of the Europe's approach to science diplomacy. Together with international partners, let us find common solutions to global challenges and build a better planet for the next generation with a global approach to research and innovation. Good afternoon, everyone from this side of the world, and welcome to the European Research and Innovation Days in Southeast Asia for 2022. My name is Jenny Lynn Almako. I'm one of the regional coordinators of your access in ASEAN. Taking place virtually from the 2nd to the 11th of November, European Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN, uh, this year engages with the twin transition of green and digital in ASEAN and EU, shining the spotlight on the creation of a circular economy, leveraging digital transformation to contribute to cutting emissions and moving towards the sustainable development goals. This year as well, if you see uh, the design of, um, the, of Euraxis, uh, of the European Research and Innovation Days, we are involved in a co-creation, an artificial intelligence or an AI together with also a human creator, joining together to make the EU RNI Days ASEAN brand identity. So the event's key art you see was co-created by an AI and designer, resulting in a vision of what our future could look like, green open fields and state-of-the-art climate-friendly architecture powered by solar energy. Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce to you my colleague, the Regional Coordinator of Euraxis in ASEAN, to talk to us about why we are gathered here today and in the next uh, two weeks. Please welcome Dr. Tosan Reznovasi. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, also from me, a very warm welcome to the 2022 edition of the European Research and Innovation Days here in ASEAN. We've designed this event as a platform for dialogue and exchange where we can jointly explore green and sustainable solutions to make our world a better place to live in. And before we start, I'm very pleased to share with you also a few words about the Euraxis project that has been organizing and hosting together with our colleagues at the EU delegation in ASEAN uh, since 2016. Now, during the last 20 years or so, the European Commission, together with the member states of the European Union and the countries that are associated to the EU Framework Programme for Research and Innovation, currently called Horizon Europe, have coordinated their national research and innovation policies to build a European research and innovation area, ERA in short, you've probably come across 
the acronym. Now, the main objective of this endeavor is to create a common space for research and innovation where ideas and where people can move around freely, where research infrastructures and research funds are shared and where cross-border cooperation truly thrives. As we know, the world is facing major challenges, societal, ecological, and economic challenges. And that's why the European Union has set the green and digital transition of the EU economy as the major target of the next decade. And this goal is also the cornerstone of the European research and innovation area of the future. Euraxis plays a key role in realizing this endeavor, in contributing to the creation of a European research and innovation area that builds a greener and a safer Europe, and that works closely with its global partners. Euraxis is a truly remarkable initiative. It is a pan-European initiative supported by 43 national member countries. It is an initiative dedicated to researchers. We strive to make mobility without obstacles a reality. We have thousands of people working in over 600 Euraxis service centers across era from Iceland down to Greece, from Portugal all the way to Turkey. And our colleagues are providing practical advice and guidance on all matters that relate to a researcher's professional life, but also to his or her daily life. We provide career development training, information on job opportunities, funding, and also hosting opportunities. As the international arm of the Euraxis network, Euraxis Worldwide is committed to building bridges between the research and innovation communities in our host countries, such as here in Southeast Asia and Europe. Our team here in Southeast Asia, Jenny and myself, we're part of the Euraxis Worldwide initiative that brings together thousands of researchers, scientists, innovators, and entrepreneurs from across the world. We have dedicated teams in Africa, in Australia and New Zealand, Latin America and the Caribbean, China, India, Japan, South Korea, North America, and of course, we are present here in Southeast, Southeast Asia. We're very proud to be working with the research communities in our countries to help them establish scientific collaboration with European partners. Now, we're very happy to welcome you to this edition of the EU Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN. We hope that you will make use of what we have in store for you in the next 10 days or so. Jenny and I would like to express our sincere thanks to our partners that are just as committed as we are to international scientific collaboration and mobility, particularly the ASEAN Secretariat, the EU mission to ASEAN, and of course, our colleagues at all the national ministries and research agencies across the region. And a particularly heartfelt thank you is due to our wonderful colleagues at the EU POP project in uh, Thailand and Jakarta. Now, we invite you to make use of all the free services that Euraxis has on offer for you. You can find us easily online under euraxis.org and of course we are present on all the social media platforms. We look forward to a fantastic European Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN 2022. Now thank you very much and back to you Jenny. Thank you very much Hassan. So there's a lot of things that we should be excited about, especially with our focus on the twin transition on green and digital. And as you can see, we are bringing together the two regions, Europe and the Southeast Asian region as well. So to speak from the side of Europe, I would like to welcome now His Excellency Igor Driesmans, the EU ambassador to the delegation of the EU in ASEAN. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the European Research and Innovation Days ASEAN 2022, the annual flagship event of Euraxis ASEAN. Through this event, audiences will be able to learn more about Horizon Europe, the EU's key funding program for research and innovation. Horizon Europe is a transnational research and innovation program 
with a budget allocation of 95.5 billion euros. It represents an increase of 30% compared to the previous program. Horizon Europe is a key instrument to see beyond the horizon towards a green, digital, healthy and resilient future of the European Union. It aims to tackle climate change, helps to achieve the UN's sustainable development goals and boosts the EU's competitiveness and growth. So why should you consider Europe as a research destination? Let me give you a few statistics. Although Europe accounts for just 6% of the world's population, we account for 17% of the world's expenditure on research and development. No less than 32% of the world's high impact scientific publications come from Europe. European researchers are responsible for 32% of the world's patent applications. Increasingly, research and innovation are global activities that require international cooperation between multiple partners. The Research and Innovation Days aim to promote mutually beneficial collaboration and dialogue on core aspects of scientific collaboration. The European Research and Innovation Days ASEAN engages with the twin transition of green and digital in ASEAN and the EU. It shines the spotlight on the creation of a circular economy, on leveraging digital transformation to contribute to cutting emissions and moving towards the sustainable development goals. It also underscores the collaborations between ASEAN and EU in the areas of science and research, policy dialogue, as well as talent circulation between Europe and Southeast Asia. The exchange of ideas and expertise on a regional level that takes place at this event will help us shape new solutions for a more sustainable, digital and greener future in Southeast Asia and Europe. The use of artificial intelligence becomes one of the most strategic technologies that can transform our world, society and industry. The EU ranks amongst global leaders in AI, science and in the ASEAN region. AI will play a key role in the digital ASEAN community. Against this backdrop, European Research and Innovation Days ASEAN has taken the leap to co-create with AI for its new brand identity this year. The key art of the event that you see in this event has been co-created by AI and a designer, resulting in this vision of what our future could look like. Green open fields and state-of-the-art climate-friendly architecture powered by solar energy. So thank you for joining us today and I wish you productive discussions. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Igor Driesmans, the ambassador of the EU delegation in ASEAN for those remarks. And now we would like to welcome from the side of Southeast Asia, we have His Excellency Satvinder Singh, Deputy Secretary General of the ASEAN Economic Community. Thanks for joining us, Ambassador. A very good day to all of you, Your Excellencies, Honorable Guests, and all of you participants. I wish to thank the organizers for inviting the ASEAN Secretariat to this year's edition of the ASEAN EU Research Innovation Day. Uh, this is my second time at this event. I remember thoroughly enjoying being part of this important platform last year because this is a platform that brings together some early career researchers. It brings together the innovators, the practitioners, and the private sectors across ASEAN to be able to come together to exchange ideas, to share best practices, and even identify potential areas for collaboration. Now, all of these collaborations with the EU partners definitely is in line with our aim to accelerate our shared region-to-region -region goal of moving more strongly into digital and green transformation. Now, the event does not only provide a platform for discourse, but more importantly, it signals the critical need for multiple stakeholders and the private sector collaboration to come together in all of us have, having to be able to then achieve our sustainable development goals. Indeed, one of the challenges that ASEAN is facing in our transition towards a greener economy 
is really putting theory into practice. I think while the ASEAN has many brilliant researchers and a lot of innovative uh, innovators out there, but I think the transition of these innovations to market implementation on the ground is not that easy. I'm wishing that, you know, from this event, um, this is where we are hoping to get the best of ideas and suggestions coming from all of you, hopefully helping us to open up doors for opportunities for us to be able to discuss practical ways for us to facilitate both digital application and commercialization. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, these coming years, we will see two very significant transitions for ASEAN. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's provided almost an opportunity for the region to take on much bolder moves towards sustainable choices. The pandemic not only illuminated the path towards digital transformation in our lives, which naturally has all shifted, you know, as we are all now continuing to depend on um, many different ways in order to overcome our mobility restrictions, um, you know, that were imposed on us during the peak of the pandemic. I think that has provided a huge amount of uh, inertia and a huge amount of uh, what I call the energies, the resourcing that went into changing the way we live, the way we work, and even the way we play, especially in areas of education and health. We couldn't have imagined that we would have transformed ourselves that much in the, over the last two to three years. Definitely what we've seen is that sustainability and digitalization, both of these elements are actually very closely intertwined. And it's not really advisable to try to treat sustainability as a separate topic from digital transformation. The efficiency created by digitalization indeed can contribute towards a lot more better circular and low carbon green growth for the region. In fact, in a recent report by Google, Tomasi and Bain and Company, a joint report by them published last year, it highlighted very clearly that carbon output from digital channels can be almost 30% lower than traditional commons. It also optimized further that, you know, things like using electrical vehicle for delivery service or recycling packaging materials. The admissions reduction can again be further um, increased by 40%. Meanwhile, the report suggested that the digitalization of the transport sector, such as using mapping technologies to optimize driving routes, something simple as that. That itself can lower carbon emissions up to 30%. Additionally, the pandemic has also demonstrated that reduced economic and social activity naturally has also resulted in overall reduction in urban emissions and electricity demands across all the major cities in the region. I'm going back to connecting the Going back to connecting the inseparable link between digitalization and sustainability goals, I would really like to share a real life example in ASEAN, where it's already happening in the ASEAN Regional Trade Facilitation Procedures. The adoption of digital technology in our custom procedures has really been helping us to improve efficiency in the global supply chains and also reducing the impact of trade operations to the environment. The use of the ASEAN Electronic Form D under our ASEAN Single Window Initiative, that has resulted in significant time saving as, you know, in terms of, um, you know, compared to using uh, paper documentation submissions, we are talking about almost 5.3 million days of savings resulting from significant time saving that's been achieved by businesses by going digital. You know, this is where faster custom clearances at the border, at the same time, a reduction in the lead time are reducing carbon emissions on trade operations for the region. Now, these are the kind of the tangible efforts that are needed to be placed in our daily lives, in the way we do our businesses and the way we operate our social lives. I think these are the kind of examples that we need to work on closer. 
In fact, I was there to even encourage the European Union. I think we need to start thinking about how do we digitally connect our two customs together and so that we can reap the benefits too on some of these uh, sustainable savings. Distinguished guest, for me, sustainability, you know, since I've been here in the ASEAN Secretariat, I've been seeing that sustainability has definitely grown. It has become a much more stronger part of our ASEAN development agenda. The urgency to address climate issues is no longer just a moral obligation. But more importantly, I think today amongst all of us and all our stakeholders, it really makes economic sense, both as global consumer behaviors, as we know, are also moving towards sustainable choices. But more importantly, we are also all beginning to realize that greater profitability, greater economic growth is also going to be bestowed upon the adoption of more sustainable choices. I think in that light, last year, the ASEAN economic ministers, they have come together quite resolutely to adopt a framework for circular economy for the ASEAN economic community. Now, this framework for circular economy provides a structured pathway for our region's transition to a low circular, low carbon model. Now, one of the strategic priorities that's how highlighted by the framework, it clearly defines the important role of innovation, the important role of digitalization, and the important role of emerging technologies in accelerating our transition towards a circular economy. Indeed, technology can also be leveraged as a conduit in the transformation towards circular model through the use of big data analytics to the use of artificial intelligence and then the use of blockchains to monitor environmental impact of certain production or processes. This year, we have also adopted the implementation plan from the framework focusing on three high impact sectors, which are high emitting sectors, namely energy sectors, the agriculture sector, and the transportation sectors. In fact, amongst the activities that have been outlined, it includes the acceleration technology adoption in all of these three sectors. For example, there's also a call for the establishment of R&D platforms to generate innovative green technology. There's even a simulator platform that we've seen, a real pilot platform for technology commercialization. There's also a promotion of digitalization of public transportation in ASEAN. Uh, these are the kind of initiatives that are beginning to be driven by the sector bodies in ASEAN in the three sectors. And we are ex ex really looking forward quite in an excited way. Many more such innovative initiatives, implementable initiatives being taken by the sectors, the three sectors. In addition to the circular economy framework and the implementation plan, the good news is ASEAN is also developing our ASEAN strategy for carbon neutrality, which again, it will be taking into account the role of low carbon technologies as well as transition technologies in the region as we sort of draft our and sort of uh, paint and vision, vision, visualize our journey towards the carbon neutral economy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the role of uh, technology in positioning ASEAN to be future ready with our resilient economy and sustainable growth is definitely very clear. Hence, that's a very important need for us to have a clear direction and a plan for the region to embrace digital transformation. Allow me to share what ASEAN is doing in the digital front. ASEAN is really ready to harness digital technologies for growth and prosperity. In fact, in the last few years, ASEAN has very successfully laid out very important policy frameworks aiming at building an enabling environment for the development of an ASEAN digital economy. In October last year, the ASEAN leaders' statement on advancing digital transformation in ASEAN, it affirmed a strategic, a holistic, and a coordinated approach to digital transformation with a very active involvement of multiple stakeholders from across ASEAN sectoral bodies and the community pillars. 
the ASEAN has also adopted several major initiatives that are really set in providing the vision of transforming our region into a leading digital community. Uh, these include first the Bandasri Bagawan Roadmap. In short, we call it the BSBR Roadmap. Uh, this is an ASEAN digital transformation agenda to accelerate our ASEAN's recovery at the same time provide push towards a greater digital economy integration. The second, we have been working on the ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025. And the third, the work plan on the implementation on the ASEAN Agreement on Electronic Commerce 2021 to 2025. Now, all of these three initiatives are very important. And together, they are building and hoping to provide the foundation to an inclusive digital ecosystem in the region and paving the way for us to establish ASEAN as a digital economy. I do not have a lot of time to go through all of these three initiatives, but let me pick out just one. And I think that's a critical one, the Banda Sri Bhagawan Roadmap and its priorities. Now, under his roadmap, in the next two years, the ASEAN Secretariat, together with the deep support of the sectoral bodies in the ASEAN, we all are actively working with member states to lay the foundation necessary on the rules and the protocols for regional connectivity and integration. First, there is going to be the focus on digital identities. And the need for us you know, to work on this has been driven by a very important study on digital identification that's being taken place right now. Uh, this project aims to look at the stage of developing digital identities in each of the ASEAN member states in order to find ways for us to be able to provide positive impact on each of the ASEAN member states. As we all know, digital identities are really the foundation of digital transformation. There's a very strong need for a trusted regional digital identity system for companies to be able to promote cross-border trade or even assessing financing across the region. Now, work is also underway to establish uh, regional, comparable and recognizable, unique business identification number in the ASEAN with a stock taking activity to assess the current landscape and at the same time, the extent of the utilization of uh, this kind of identity in each of the ASEAN member states. Second, under the Bandar Sri Gavan Roadmap, there is also a priority on a regional digital payment connectivity. As we all know, e-commerce is the growth of, uh, is also the driver of growth in ASEAN today. Therefore, establishing an interoperable cross-border e-payment ecosystem is really core to setting the infrastructure of ASEAN digital economy. Digital payment in our region is expected to grow to almost a staggering amount of USD 1.2 trillion by 2025. And this is leveraging on digital technologies where it's important that we are beginning to see in ASEAN member states much active efforts towards integrating and initiating bilateral and multilateral arrangements to facilitate cross-border payments under the ASEAN payment policy framework for cross-border real-time retail payment systems. A lot of progress I'm glad to see happening between member states. Third, under the Bandas Bergaman roadmap, we are also prioritizing the Secretary is working with our partners, including UNTAC and the ADB, in order to plan a strengthening of the capacity building of the legal uh, courts in the ASEAN member states, getting the legal fraternity in order to be preparing them to help them legislate and also to prepare the courts to accept digital documents as evidence um, in the transfer of assets and ownership, especially needed in dispute resolutions. Now, this is extremely important work that will provide the essential foundation for private sector to move towards paperless trade contractual documents. Now, without all of these kind of efforts that I've just mentioned, we are not going to move in in significant transformation. Now, these are foundational activities that are already actively being pushed. And hopefully, uh, this is going to provide a lot of opportunity for private sector to then innovate and also to then transform the entire region. 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our ASEAN transition journey towards digital and green economy, we all know is in the early stage and we definitely need the support of all stakeholders to help us accelerate this transition. And we also want to make sure that this transition is an inclusive and a safe process for all our citizens in the region. We also look forward to the European and the ASEAN Leaders Summit announcements later in the year, in December, where we are hoping the European Union will be able to come forward actively in providing us deeper support in capacity development for the region in both digitalization as well as in sustainability areas. With that, once again, I'm wishing all of you and the panelists a very successful conversation and discussion. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Satvinder Singh of the ASEAN Economic Community for that elaborate uh, presentation on what ASEAN is also doing when it comes to the twin transition. Thank you so much. And at this point, you know, when we planned, when Susanna, Susanna and I planned uh, this program, we this is not just a series of panels and talks. This is really a call to action. And so we want to break the silos. We want to work together. And so we have invited someone who is doing that in Southeast Asia for quite some time, but he has also spoken to the EU and to the global challenge, uh, to, the, to the global community on this challenge of, of digital transformation and sustainability. And I would like him to take the room now. Please welcome the executive director of the Association for Young Environmental Journalists, my very good friend, Mr. Val Emil Vestile. The room is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jen. Uh, good afternoon to everyone from the Philippines. Lando, Pedring, Rolly, Ulysses, Piping, Ompong, Glenda, Pablo, Odette, Sendong, Yolanda. On a usual day in the Philippines, these would be familiar Filipino nicknames that we would typically use. But to millions of Filipinos, these names leave a haunting mark and trigger so much trauma, as these are the names of the most destructive and catastrophic typhoons to have hit the Philippines in the last 15 years alone. Sendong especially it's close to home as it ravaged my hometown of Cagayan de Oro City. I literally had a bird's eye view from inside an airplane of the bodies floating along the riverbanks, something that I cannot remove from my memory and something that I take with me until today. And that storm has claimed the lives of over a thousand people, left over a thousand others missing and displaced over 110,000 families eventually making headlines to become the world's deadliest storm of 2011 in my hometown. And while that might have just been another statistic or a record breaker, for me and my city, that meant losing the lives of the people we loved the most. I know of a college professor who until today is searching by foot the entire region of Mindanao for his firstborn son. He hasn't given up and it has been more than 10 years already. While storms and typhoons are natural calamities, changes in climate that result to global warming and warmer seas intensify these natural calamities to be more destructive than it already is. And scientific consensus has revealed that the warming of the earth is indeed directly linked to anthropogenic pressures, AKA human intervention, AKA our own doing. So in essence, it is not the storm that takes the life of a human person, but a human person turning in on its own, taking the life of their fellow human. When you come to think about it, it's actually 21st century barbarism. Why would I start my challenge to the world with such a bleak and awful undertone? Because I believe it is human nature 
can never really act on danger unless danger is right in front of us. And I am here to say that it is. This is the face to the numbers. The climate crisis is here. The climate crisis is not an expected outcome. It is happening here and it is happening now. And we are all facing very real threats of climate disasters and the inevitable impacts of global warming and environmental degradation. But just because it is here does not mean we cannot do anything about it. So what can we do about it? On the occasion of the EU Research and Innovation Days, I would contend four things that we can do and that we should be doing. And it's all related to science, research, and development. Because at its core, issues on climate and issues on the environment can be addressed more accurately and more progressively if it is informed by science and research. So my challenge to the world is rooted in four things. First, we need to listen to the science. As a college educator on science journalism myself and a nonprofit leader of an ecological literacy nonprofit called Ayedge, working on building capacities on climate communication and environmental journalism, I know very well the power that information holds to set the agenda of a community. But we can only appreciate the information if we actually listen to it. Because, and I've read this once, the, that, that theories informed by science have the power to make accurate predictions that competing worldviews cannot make. So scientific expertise isn't overrated. And our personal interests and worldviews should never outweigh the science especially when it has gone through the correct scientific processes. Which leads me to my second challenge, which is for us, after listening to the science, to trust in the science, and especially in this digital age. While the digital age opens up a plethora of opportunities, hence the launch, it also opens up some remarkable threats and risks like in this age of social media, where experts who have spent decades and decades of their profession doing research on an issue have equal platforms with internet strangers who are passionate and who are free to believe whatever they prefer to be true. Science is not a preference of truth. Science is collected information. We need to trust in the science in a sense that science is built on accuracy. Accuracy that was founded on high quality and credible sources, professional track record, critical thinking, profound theoretical frameworks. While we acknowledge that yes, there are indeed uncertainties attached to the sciences, we also have to acknowledge the body of work being put into play to arrive at credible and legitimate scientific consensus. My third challenge is a bit personal, and these are for journalists and my fellow media professionals. After we listen to the science, and after we trust the science, we also need to effectively communicate the science. You know, the public's main source of information about science and technology is the mass media. According to a study in 2019, the vast majority of non-specialists or general audiences obtain almost all of their knowledge about science from journalists who serve as the primary gatekeepers of scientific information. There is a growing number of scientists and an increase in research expenditure which means we are graced with more research findings than ever before. While there is no shortage of science stories to tell, there is a shortage of journalists who can tell the story well. There is an important obligation to bridge the world of science and the community affected by the science. And I believe journalists and media professionals should be that bridge. 
and the final challenge I would like to pose, which is probably, I would argue, the most challenging to do. After listening to the science, after trusting the science, and after communicating the science, we need to respond to the science. Listening to the science, trusting in the science, and communicating the science will all be for nil if we do not actively respond to the science. The impact of science and scientific breakthrough will only stay in the laboratories or in the think tanks or in research institutes if governments, civil society, and big businesses do not act and respond to these scientific breakthroughs. And very quickly, I would just like to say that we need to be able to do the important work of urging and pressuring governments to act and respond to the science. Because much of the planet is public property and public property is owned by governments. So it is not only their moral responsibility to protect our planet, it is also their mandate. Again, if you're a government leader, listen to me. It is not only your moral responsibility to protect our planet. It is also your mandate. The ball is on your court. Norwegian social worker and environmental activist Knut Ivar Bjurliko Kau talked about ecological love, a deep connection to our homes and the love for our surrounding environments. And he described that in the same breath, in the presence of love, there is also the presence of sorrow, of loss, of suffering, and of mourning. Unless we develop our deep connection to the only planet we live on, and unless we understand the kind of love the environment has for us, and the kind of love that we need to give it, we will continue to experience sorrow, loss, suffering, and mourning. And we won't be able to protect it the way that we should. We should really stop talking and start doing. The conversation on the climate crisis is no longer a debate on the economic or political interests. It is now a debate on human survival. And this is problematic because our survival as a species should never be a subject of debate in the first place. And because we're talking about survival, I contend that we now cohabitate in a climate emergency. We need not to wait until 2030, 2050, until we finally move, or the next COP27, COP28, COP29. Millions have already been left behind. The climate, already, the climate crisis has already hit us, and hit, it has hit us hard. And it will continue to do so until we turn all these debates, these conversations, these webinars into real policies, real programs, and real partnerships. Thank you at maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat. Thank you so much for that challenge, Val. To trust the science, to communicate the science, to respond to the science, and of course to develop really this love for this world. So thank you so much for that. So over the two weeks, European Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN will discuss topics ranging from the challenges of energy transition, digitalization, sustainable development, public-private partnerships, green and digital innovations, ASEAN-EU digital collaboration, the transformative effect of science to digitalization and global health and many more. But the really at the end of the day, the message is the same. We really have to act now for our planet and for each other. So this ends the opening keynotes uh, for the EU Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN. Please join us in the next few minutes for the first panel discussion. Please check out uh, the website uh, for, uh, for the links uh, to the session, and we'll see you there. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>